I want to show you my 2021 newly revamped God in a Box. This God in a Box, you can take wherever you go. It's nice. It's comfortable. It's convenient. Fits in your pocket, right? I've got, I've got my little God picture right here. This was uh, designed and created by my daughter, Marie. It's very pretty because I know God likes pretty things. This is my God in a box. And it will be on sale in the back for $29.95, just five easy payments. <laughs> now I know that that, that sounds a, a bit crazy and no, for the record, I'm not selling God in a box. But there was a time in the Israelites where they worshipped the God of the box. And they worshipped the God of the box, which was the Ark of the Covenant, right? The Ark of the Covenant was a symbol of God, of God's presence in the form of this box. And it held the, um, it held the sacred materials. Um, this was to be in the uh, Holy of Holies, in the tent. This could only be um, approached by and carried by the holiest of men, right? And so there was a time in, in Israel where they worshipped the God of the box. Today my sermon is entitled, God in a Box. Okay? Now, God obviously, got a game going on that that's okay. Now, God obviously doesn't want to be used in this way. And even though I'm joking, sometimes, quite honestly, this is how we treat God, right? We put him in a box and we say, okay, God, you just stay right here. When I need you, I'll let you know. But let me put you away for now. And, you know, because that waitress, that waitress, she got my order wrong. I said pickles. She didn't put pickles. So I'm going to go have a talk with the waitress. God, no, you don't need to be in this conversation. Let me go talk to this waitress. And hopefully, if God blesses this, hopefully the waitress will be talked to by her manager. She'll be fired. And amen. God, go ahead and bless that. Right? I know it sounds exaggerated, but don't we do that at times? Don't we do that? We set our, our God aside, we put him in our box, and we say, okay, I'm going to take care of this. And so for the Israelites, they traveled around, and the, the Israelites were victorious. They had victory after victory after victory, and everywhere they went, they took the Ark of the Covenant with them because God was with them in the victories. But something changed over time. Instead of worshiping the God, the God of the box, they worshiped the box of God. The, go the box became the symbol of their victory. The box became something that re re they relied on. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 4. The book of 1 Samuel is the, it, it, it's, I don't know any other way to describe it other than it is a crazy series of terrible events. It's kind of like that Lemony Snicket show, that, you know, series of unfortunate events. This is the Israelites' time for a series of unfortunate events. And so, Jess, can you hand me my drink? And so... The Israelites, in chapter 4, we're going to see kind of what, what's going on. The Israelites, they started in, um, in chapter 1, verse 4. It says, now the Israelites went out to fight against the Philistines. The Israelites camped at Ebenezer and the Philistines at Aphek. The Philistines deployed their forces to meet Israel and as the battle spread, Israel was defeated 
and was ki uh, they killed about 4,000 of them on the battlefield. Now, that doesn't, in, in, in war terms, that's not a lot of people, but they meant something to somebody. So why did they lose that fight if they were so victorious all of, the, all of these times? Well, for one, they went into battle without God, first and foremost. But they went, let's, let's look at verse 3. It says, when the soldiers returned to the camp, the elders, not the lay people, not, you know, Joe Christian, the, the elders said, why did the Lord bring defeat on us today before the Philistines? Let us go back and bring the Ark of the Lord's Covenant from Shiloh so that he, but if you go into the King James Version, it says, so that it, so that it may go with us and save us from the hands of our enemies. <clears throat> so it became all about the box. And so they were like, that's why, that's why we're, we're, not, we're not succeeding. That's why I'm not victorious because I didn't bring my box. I didn't bring my lucky charm with us into battle. It didn't say, let's go get God. Let's go back to God. No, it was all about the box. <clears throat> I know for me, anytime I use God as some type of token, as some type of lucky charm as God in a box, I end up with a lot of failures. Can you relate? I end up stumbling back licking my wounds, and oftentimes, I do just what the Israelites did. Why, God? Why did you let this happen to me? I start blaming God. You know, I love the Word of God because when we read it, it's always applicable. We can always use it. It's always living. You know, Do you carry around a lucky charm or a box? Do you carry around something? Well, I've got my Bible with me today. I haven't read it in a few months, but I've got it. It's in my car somewhere, I think, maybe, right? Well, no, I know where it is in the house. It's on that. No, it's over. Yeah, I've got it. It's in the house somewhere, and I'm good. Do you use, your, do you use God's Word? Do you use God? As a lucky charm, do you put him in a box? You know, a lot of times we use our box, we just use it as, a, uh, a as our blessing. We go into battle or into our day-to-day -day life knowing that there are struggles ahead. And we're like, okay, God, but I need you to bless me. I need you to bless this action. I know I didn't think, think it through. I didn't go to you in prayer. I didn't meditate on your word. But now that I'm in this situation, God, go ahead. D do your thing. I need you to bless me. I, I know I have. I know that when I was going back and I was rereading this and I was looking at the scripture, I thought, man, God, this is for me. I need to put... I need to take God out of that box. You know, a lot of times when we think about blessings, we want these blessings to happen. And if you've been around long enough, you'll, you realize that it's not always, the blessings don't always come by getting the things that you want, right? Think back in your, in your life, at a time where you really, really wanted something and God didn't give you, but now you can look back and retrospect and go, thank you. Thank you for, I am so glad God did not give me what I wanted. Because the blessings aren't so that we can be glorified. It's so that God can be glorified. Because it's not about the, the box of God, it's about the God of God the box. It's the one who created it. And they turned God into a villain. They blamed God for defeat. You can't use God. 
God wants to use you. Let's say it again. You can't use God. God does not want to be used by you. God wants to use you. God wants to, for you to be usable to him. And that may not look like something that, that you were thinking of in your head. That may not look like the trajectory you wanted to go. But when you say, God, I want to be usable to you. I want you to use me in my life. I guarantee you God is going to put you to work and you're going to be tired, but it will be worth it. It'll, it'll absolutely be worth it. If you go back and you look at the, the directions pertaining to the Ark of the Covenant, there were very specific guidelines that God put in place for the, uh, in, in the way to handle the Ark. And the Israelites disregarded all of it. So they go back and they, they were, uh, as we continue on, they go back and they say, okay, we figured it out. We didn't bring the box with us. So we're going to send these two guys. And these two guys just blow my mind. Hophni and Phinehas. They were Eli's sons. Okay, remember Eli. Eli was the one in charge of mentoring Samuel. And we haven't really talked about Samuel very much. But if we go back in our Bibles, if we're reading our Bibles, we remember Samuel was the young boy that was laying down and God had called him. And he kept waking up and, and going to Eli and saying, yes, Eli, I'm here. And Eli, the grumpy old man, was like, no, 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 go to bed. And then it finally got to, well, maybe that is God calling you. And so Samuel ends up being in the care of Eli. But Eli had two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. And these two rebellious leaders' kids, you can go back in verse, uh, chapter 12. You can go back in chapter 12 and look at Hophni and Phinehas. These guys were crazy. They were leaders in the church in, as part of the priesthood. And they would go around. The, the uh, direction that was given was for any of the, the priests that they would go and they would take a fork-like uh, object and they would stick it in the boiled meat that was being cook, cooked up by the people. Whatever stayed on the meat, then they were able to keep that. And, and so Hophni and Phinehas using their power, misusing their power, if you will, uh, would go to those people and say, no, 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 I don't want it boiled. I want the raw meat. Bring me the raw meat. Give me the brisket with all the fat, all the trimmings. I want all of it because we don't want boiled meat. And if you don't, I will take it by force. So I say all of that to say the Israelites decided it was a good idea to, br to tell Hophni and Phinehas to put them in charge of going and getting the box. Men who were rebellious towards God's direction. Well, we're going to have them be in charge. And we're going to have them walk, carry, carry out the box. And we're going to take that into battle. So now that they've got the, the box, right, the Ark of the Covenant, we would think that maybe they, would, maybe they could be victorious. So they go in, and as, we, as, you, as you continue on in, cha in chapter 4, it says that they came into the camp in verse 5, when the Ark of the Lord's Covenant came into the camp, all Israel raised such a great shout that the ground shook. Hearing the uproar, the Philistines uh, asked, what's all this shouting in the Hebrew camp? And they found out, oh no! The Israelites brought their secret weapon. They brought the ark. Because they were no strangers to what it, Israel was doing to all of the other armies. They were, they were no stranger. The difference was the Philistines were a people of many gods. They didn't care anything about our God. They cared about their own gods. And they're basically their gods were whatever pleases them, whatever feels good, that's, that's going to be my God. But they knew the reputation that the Israelites had. But they focused on the idol, the box, right? And so they freaked out. And you would think that they would be in defeat, but no, they, they, the Philistines were victorious. And they slaughtered about 40,000, let's see here in, in um, 
verse... Ten. So the Philistines fought, and the Israelites were defeated, and every man fled to, the, to their tent. The slaughter was very great. Israel lost 30,000 foot soldiers. And oh, the ark was captured. So now, in their disobedience, they've lost not 4,000 men, but 30,000 men. See, when we try to use God, it just get, keeps getting worse. Things just go from bad to worse. They continue because God does not want to be used. And so they lost not only the 30,000 men, they lost the ark. They all lost the symbol of God's presence and power in their community. <laughs> See, when we, when we fail to obey God, it doesn't just affect us. It affects all of the people that we interact with, all of the people that are around us. Our sin, they're not responsible. My wife, we had this talk last night. My wife is not responsible for my sin, right? I'm not saying that the sins of the father are passed on to the son. No, no, no. But my sin certainly affects her. When I am angry with her or I am angry with the kids and I sin, don't you think it hurts her? I know it does because she tells me and I have to repent. But it affects our disobedience starts going further and further and further out. It starts affecting more and more people. Because we have influences, some of us have kids, we have relatives, we have friends, neighbors. They watch us. They say, okay, you call yourself a Christian, you say that you are obedient to Christ, but I saw this and I don't, I'm not going to follow your God, right? The Israelites were, were so mixed up and so devastated. You know what else happened when they lost, in that number of, of 30,000, you know what other two people died? Hophni and Phinehas. And if you go back in chapter 2, Hophni and Phinehas, the Lord was so angry with their behavior, with their sin, not just their behavior, but their sin, that he... He prophesied to Eli that they would die. So when the men returned to the camp, they told Eli, uh, they had given him the news of what happened, and Eli, sitting on a chair, fell off that chair in great distress, broke his neck, and died. And my wife and I were talking about this last night is, well, why did, why did Eli, what happened to Eli? Why did he, what was the big deal? He, he wasn't in all of this mix. Why did he die? But he allowed, he was the leader of Israel for 40 years. And he allowed his knucklehead leader kids to continue to disobey God. And so there was punishment for sin, Right? And so, Hophni and Phinehas, Eli, and then, as we read on, as we look on, and I would encourage you, I'm not reading through all of it because we're looking through three different chapters, but go back and read this. It's, a, it's an incredible story. Go back and look at this. It talks about in verse 19 of chapter 4 that the daughter-in-law of Eli, so the wife of Phinehas, she was pregnant and near the time of birth when she had heard the news that the Ark of the Covenant had been captured and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead. She went into labor immediately. And as she was dying in labor, her servant said, hey, but don't worry, you're going to have a son. You know what she named his, her son? She named her son Ichabod, which meant God has left or God has departed from us. 
because she understood what it meant for the Ark of the Covenant to be gone. She understood that it was more than just a box. She understood that it, it was God leaving them, God allowing this to happen because of their disobedience. And, and so as she died, a child was born, Ichabod. Now in chapter 5, the, the Philistines, so they've got the box. They're all excited. They're running around. They're showing everybody the box. They decide, I know what we're going to do with this box. We're going to put this box right there in front of, well, they can't see that, but that's okay. We're going to put this box right in front of our big god, Dagon. Now, Dagon, I was looking at some of the pictures on Dagon. He's this, like, weird mermaid-looking guy with a funny hat on his head. And he, so they placed this, uh, they placed the Ark of the Covenant before their god. And they had people come by and look at the Ark of the Covenant. They, they basked in their glory. They basked in their victory. But it wasn't a victory for the Philistines. Because as we, as we continue on, the Philistines began to be plagued with rats. They began to grow tumors in, in areas of the body which are unmentionable. And you would never want tumors to be growing. So they're not having a good time having the box. Right? The ark of the covenant because you can't capture God God wants to capture you see the Philistines thought they had it all figured out because they had captured God but you can't capture him God wants to be wants to capture you God wants to capture each and every one of our hearts and so and because he's God thank you Liam so the Philistines, they think, okay, this is, this is bad. We've got to fix this. We've got to figure this thing out. So what they decided to do was they go, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to put the ark on a cart. We're going to put, we're going to take some of the tumors. We're going to take them out of our bodies and we're going to take them and we're going to cast them in gold, which is really strange. But they're the Philistines. They did a lot of weird things for their gods. Plural. Little G's. They did a lot of crazy things. And oh, we're not going to take just our tumors. We're going to take the rats. So, because the rats were plaguing them. They knew what happened to the Egyptians when they went against God and the Israelites. They thought, we are going to make a sin offering to their God. We're going to send this cart. We're going to put all of it on the cart. And we're going to attach two calves... Uh, two cows that just had calves onto this cart. And if these, if these cows leave on the cart on their own and leave their babies behind, then we will know that God has done this to us. And we will know that it will be okay. Oh, I forgot, I forgot a part before that. So if that wasn't crazy enough, they had the, they had the ark in front of Dagon. You know what happened to Dagon? This God that they believed in, little G, this God that they believed in and they felt like they would taunt our God, big G, with right in front of the ark. The big G, that's right. The next morning, Dagon fell face first before God, before the ark. So they decided well, we're going to put him back up. The very next morning, he not only fell face down before our God, but his hands and his head were off. And I think God was trying to prove a point. That there is no God before me. Remember the Ten Commandments? Thou shalt not have any God before me. And so, Dagon, you're done. So they, they take the ark and they put the ark on the cart. They take the calves, they put the calves, connect them to the ark. They get the, the golden tumors, which probably were really gross. They take the golden rats, also gross, put them on the cart, and they, and 
the cow the cows put their heads down and walk straight back to the Israelite camp. Now that gets back to the camp and certainly you've got to think at this point the Israelites realize what is going on and realize that their God had left them and they all repent because we all repent immediately the first time, right? No? No, not all of them at least. Some of them understood what that meant, but some of them decided, hey, I think it's a good idea. Let me check out what's in the box and boom, dead. Because again, they were disobedient to what God had told them that they, they could not look in the box. See, because it's all about the obedience of God and God wants to be obeyed. Amen. So, the Philistines send the ark back. The Israelites realize that, okay, we've got the ark back. We've had people now die again because of their disobedience. And they go to, they finally set, uh, go to Samuel. They come back to Samuel and they say, um, what does Samuel say in chapter 7? In verse 3 it says, So Samuel said to the Israelites, If you were returning to the Lord with all your hearts, then rid yourselves of the foreign gods and the Asheroths and commit yourselves to the Lord and serve Him only. And He will deliver you out of the hands of the Israelites. You know, some of us, it talks about the Israelites. One of the reasons why they were, they were having such a difficult time was they started putting idols before God. The Asheroths and the Baals. They started putting these things before God and they had forgotten about their God. And Samuel is telling them to recommit God. But don't we do that? Don't we do that? We take our careers and we shine them up and we spend all the time making sure that they're perfect and I've got to push towards this career. We take sports. Well, if this guy isn't done in the next five minutes, I'm going to be missing the kickoff. I know it's not football season, but, but see, y'all would have corrected me because football is so important. Sports are so important. We start to put these gods. What's the God that, that you have put in front of you? Is it job, success, relationships? Some of us, maybe it's our physique. I got to be at the gym four times a day because I got to look this good. <laughs> maybe some of us, it's just plain old comfortability. I don't want to. That's my God. I don't want to today. I know I've had those days where I've had to get up and say, okay, God, I got to repent. I got to change this. I cannot be comfortable today. I need to move forward because I want to be used by God. I want to be usable to God. I want God to use me. Don't you want God to use you and do something absolutely incredible? To do something, to be in a place where you look down the road and you say, God, I don't know how we're here, but man, you're incredible. I know when I look at my wife, I say that. I don't tell her enough. But I look at my wife, I look at my life before my wife. And the disappointment, the the. the the heartache and the divorce and the, t the terrible things. And I look, and, and there was a time that I blamed God for that. I'll never forget Southside Lions Park. Shout out to the South Side of San Antonio. South Side. Where I stood in a field and I blamed God for what he did in my marriage. But I was disobedient. 
And I look back and I say, I want to be used by God. I repented and changed. Amen. And God said, but I have something for you. Be usable. And I've got something that you... <laughs> You're not good enough for this woman, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and give her to you. Not that she's a possession, right? Just not that she's not a possession, right? Women's rights. She, I'm wearing pink. Calm down. She's not a possession. God gave her to me to be my partner. To hold me up when I need to be held up. To challenge me, to correct me, to do all of those things. It's time for us to stop putting God in a box. It's time for us to worship the God of the box. Now, the Ark of the Covenant, as we're, I'm, I'm bringing it in, I promise. The Ark of the Covenant was a resemblance of, of what Jesus was to be to us. Whenever there was a time for sacrifice, once a year, the holiest of holy would go in and they would make a sin offering. They would, they would sacrifice an animal and they would, they would pour out this animal onto the, uh, sorry, onto the seat. They would pour out their sin offering onto that seat, the glory seat. And that was, a resem that, that was a illustration that was to remind them of what was to come. Jesus was to come and be our Savior. To be God on earth that would walk with us and that, we would, that would carry us at times and that we would be able to go before Him and repent of our sins we would, we would be able to, because God made the ultimate sacrifice, Jesus was the one. There was no more lamb that would be cut on a, on a mercy seat. God got up on that mercy seat, if you will. Jesus was there on the cross and made the ultimate sacrifice so that we could have a relationship with him, so that we could be used by him. Because God wants to capture us. God wants to capture our hearts. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, thank you for capturing our hearts. Thank you for always being by our side in the victories, in the defeats. Because you will be glorified whether we are in victory or defeat. God, we ask that we are usable by you. That we stop using you. That I stop using you. But I, that I treat your word as sacred and holy. And that I obey. God, thank you for your son's ultimate sacrifice. For the death on the cross. And that we, we can be able to walk with you in step and be used by you every day. God, we love you. We thank you. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Sorry. Okay, I've got just a couple of announcements here. Um, if you are giving your, your tithe online, it's at rgv.church. The special contribution is on June 30th. I think we have a slide for that. But the special contribution is on June 30th. We want to be giving to our Andean Mission Alliance. Um, the men's midweek is this Wednesday. So men... We will be here and live uh, on Zoom uh, for Men's Midweek. The women are able to, they, they've got, uh, they're doing their own thing. But the men will be here. Uh, let's be in prayer for Sophie's dad. 
who is currently in the hospital. Um, he, I, I just got a, a call this morning about it. He is doing a little bit better, um, but he's not out of the woods yet. He's still in the hospital. And so uh, please be keeping him in your prayers. That's uh, Sophie's dad. Um, the RGV Church and the Aggieland Church will be doing a collection for the Upbring Shelter, uh, which is here in McAllen, in the, in, uh, yeah, in McAllen. The collection will go through the month of May, and the donation will be distributed in June. So we're going to be collecting all of it all in the month of May, okay? But then we'll actually take it and we'll deliver it, uh, distribute it in June. A link for selecting those items will be sent out to the Bible Talk leaders. Um, so please, as Bible Talk leaders, make sure that you are sending that out to all of the people in your uh, Bible Talks so that uh, they can have that list and we can all uh, really give to these young people. Uh, these are kids ages 12 to 17. Uh, we want to be able to help them with those necessary supplies. We also want to be praying for Anna's uh, daughter, her health. I don't know what uh, specifically is going on with Anna's daughter, but uh, let's be praying for her health and make sure that uh, God is with her, helping her uh, to heal. <clears throat> At this time, we will... Yes, sir. She's in the hospital with pneumonia. Okay. Dati. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. Dati. Uh, she's uh, in the uh, Aguiland Church. Um, Anna's daughter. So let's be praying for Tati. At this time, we're going to go to God in a word of prayer, and then we will close out with one final song. God, as we pray this morning again to you, we ask that you be with those that are in, in desperate need of your help, that are uh, battling illnesses, uh, that are lost and alone. Not just those that are sick, God, but those that are sick emotionally and and uh, sick spiritually, those that are hurting, that are crying out to you, I ask God that you hear them, that you be with them this morning, that you show them, that, that you open our eyes to see the needs and that we can go and, and minister to them, that we can take care of and meet those needs. God, be with us uh, every day and that we, that, that we focus on, on you and, and how holy you are. We love you and we pray that all this in your son's name. Amen.